few weeks ago, we started a series called Next, and, and we started with, you are here. And then we talked about how you got here. And then I asked, where are you desiring to go? We talked about it. We talked about where your here is, and we talked about where you desire to go. And sometimes we know where we would desire to go, but we don't know how to get where we want to go. Isn't that true? You say, you go on vacation, you say, let's go to Dallas, or let's go to uh, Panama City, and you desire that, but you say, I can't get there, I need to have help, so we plug in Google Maps, or we look at our iPhone, and we Google that address, and we find out how to get there, how many miles it is, how far it is. We would never be able to get there unless we find out where there is and once we find out where the there is, then we can put into action how to get where we want to go. Have you ever started a project that was a little bigger than you thought? All the guys said, yeah. yeah it cost too much. It was bigger than you thought. Then you always had to call in for some help. And sometimes we, we, in our journey, we are afraid that the journey that we're on is going to take too long or it's going to cost too much and the fear that we just quit because we don't want to pay the price. We're scared of that. We're all on a journey to there. We're trying to reach, whether it's our new level in our career, a relationship, a marriage, a graduation, or to buy a home. But today we may be talking about our spiritual relationship with God. Where is the there when we're talking about your relationship with God? How do we get there? How do we know where the there is? How do we know that we're not making the wrong turn? You know, you take that little GPS out and you're trying to find a place and it's a new town and, and you know what, where about it is and maybe you put in the GPS and you put in Boulevard instead of Avenue. Or maybe you put in street, or maybe you, you know the name of the street, but you don't put something in, and all of a sudden, you're trusting this device to get you someplace where you have no idea where it is. And after a few minutes or hours, you pull up to the desired location to find out that the location is wrong. Because we put in the GPS wrongly. And sometimes, I believe in life, we put in the improper destination into our compass, our moral compass, and we find out that where we have been is not where God wants us to go. What do we do when we have to make an adjustment to our course? What do we do? John was talking to his disciples, and he was telling his disciples, he goes, he goes I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I go and prepare a place for you, there you can be with me. And Thomas said, I don't know where you're going. None of the disciples knew. And Jesus said to them, and, there, and where I am, there you may be also, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, I don't know where you are. And he says this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going and how you can get there. Have you ever felt that with you in a relationship with God? I desire a more intense a more radical, a more of an intimate relationship with God. And you're saying, Lord, I don't even know what to do tomorrow. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. Whether you are in a denomination where you feel that you can get to heaven as long as you are good, as long as you have a sincerity, the Bible says, Jesus says in John, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And this is our last week, and we're going to take a few verses, and we're going to talk about what we need to do. What do we need to leave behind? What do we need to embrace if we are going to make changes in life? If we are going to have that ultimate destination in a relationship with God, we want to be there, and we want the there to be exactly where God wants us to be. It is no fun being at the wrong there. It's no fun doing the wrong thing. It's no fun finding out at the end of the destination, I did not do it right. 
So what we must do before we start the destination of where our there is, we need to make sure our there is where God wants us to go. Luke chapter 5 again. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners of Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now you are to catch man. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. They dropped their nets. The first thing that we need to drop, if we would use the nets as the analogy, is we have to drop our fears. Fear can be captivating. The fear of tomorrow, the fear of destination, the fear of the unknown, the fear of can I take care of myself. Fear is a natural reaction to the unknown. God knows that that is our fear. He understands that's our fear. When uh, Joshua uh, was taking over the Israelites from, from Moses, and just what um, Brennan just read in verses 5 through 9, he said, do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged because your Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For the people you shall divide inheritance into this land. I swore to the fathers that I give them. Only this, be strong and be very courageous that you may observe to do according to the law which Moses, my servant, was commanded. Joshua, the, the leader, had that fear. The disciples, Jesus says, don't be afraid. See, we think about the leaders standing up and they have no fears and everything is natural for them. Even the biggest leaders that you know have fear within their heart and they must stand before God and say, Lord, I need you to help me in my fears. Jesus told these disciples, don't be afraid. I know that you're going to do something that's going to change the world. It's bigger than you could ever possibly imagine. It's greater than you could even, even dream of. And when you stood up and you realized that I am the Son of God and you bowed your knees before me, you knew that your destiny had been changed. And when we give our life to Jesus Christ and we know that our faith is secure in him, when we come up and meet him face to face, our destiny has been changed. Our direction has been changed. But our fear is still deep within us. How many of us would say, I want to do something different. I want to do something great for God. I want to be at there, wherever the there is that God has in store for us. But what we are, we're afraid. Can I achieve it? Will I fail at it? Our fears sometimes captivate us to a point that they put us in bounds and we cannot escape the fear of going where God wants us to go. He says that we need to not be afraid. What is it that we need to drop? The first thing we need to drop is fear. How would our relationship with God be if we were not afraid of that relationship? How would our relationship be with God if we were not afraid and ask him, search me, O oh Lord. Ask him to find out if there's any wicked way within me. If we can be open and honest with God and not be afraid of what he will do, because we have to understand, he is a merciful God. He is a loving God. He wants to take our fears, our sins, and he wants to take them and he wants to put them on his back. He wants to put no condemnation on us but he wants to put us in a loving relationship with him. The Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, do not be afraid. 
That's what Jesus is saying. You're with me now. Don't be afraid. I can take care of it. For your entire life, you were a fisherman. Entire life, you worked all night to catch fish. But you're with me now. Don't worry about it. You lived your life separate from me for your entire life. But now you're asking to go in the destination to the there that I want you to go to. You're not alone anymore. I'm with you. We have to drop the fear. And when we drop the fear, then we can start moving towards Christ. The second thing that we have to leave behind is security. Is security. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Peter and the other fishermen left everything. It sounds difficult to think about it. They left their jobs, their homes, their families, everything familiar to follow a man by the name of Jesus. Feeling secure can blind us to the reality of God's movement. What I have. I don't want to lose what I have. I, I, I have worked too hard for what I have. And any time that we desire our security over our relationship with God, we have put security as God. And God will have to remove the security in order to get you where he wants you to go. So how do we do that? What, a, what is it that, that we are in bondage to? We, we're giving him our fear, but our security. You know, we could even take that in our life. Our insurance, uh, something takes place, and, and we insure our homes, and we insure our cars, and we insure our lives to make sure that if something takes place, we are going to be able to get it back the way that we want it, or to be able to have it status quo in the way that we used to have it. We like the security. We all do. But if the security that we're in is keeping us from going where God wants us to go, the security has become the stumbling block. Here's the key. Whatever you have, whether it is your resources or whether it is your talents, whether it is your children, whatever you have is not yours. If you would give your kids to God, God would take care of your kids. If you will give your resources to God, God will take care of your resources. It's not about tithing. It's about ownership. If you put your home under God's protection, he'll take care of your home. doesn't mean it's always going to be wonderful and there's not going to be any arguments. But God will take care of your home. If you put your salvation in God's hand, your salvation will be secure for eternity. You're wondering why your life is in a deja vu every year, every month, every time. The same old, same old happens all the time because you are in control. You desire security more than desire God. And we have to drop that security. We have to, th th there's even a funny story. It's a sad story. Not funny. It's a sad story found in Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. And when Pharaoh drew near... The children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were graves, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is there not the word that we would have told the Egyptians, saying, Let us alone, and we will be serving the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than it would be to die in the wilderness. What does that mean? That means they were so used and comfortable of the status quo. They would rather be bound in slavery than free in God. And they looked at Moses and said, why did you do this? This is hard. There's our enemy coming over. They didn't trust in God. They allowed their insecurities about their future to say, I, I, I'm afraid. 
We should have stayed where we were. We knew where we were. We knew what we had. It was tough. It was hard. But we knew it. Moses says, listen, what I have in store for you, what God has in store for you, is so much better than being slaves in Egypt. I have a wonderful life in store for you. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to be with you every step of the way. Sometimes our security is keeping us from doing what God wants us to do. The disciples left everything that made them secure in order to follow a man that they knew had the power to make them secure. We like the feeling of security. We will even give up things in order to keep our status quo. If we were being honest with God, when we say, I trust God, we're saying it actually means, I trust God to keep me where I am. I trust God that my resources will stay where it is. I trust God that my family will be okay. I trust God to keep me comfortable. And I'll tell you, I believe before we can be comfortable, we have to give up our security. And where our security is, is what I have. God wants to rock our world to a point that you are not secure. And when he rocks our world to the point that we're not secure, what do we do? What happens when the calamity takes place? What happens when things come, when things go, when we are not in control, when we lose our security? Either we get mad at God or we fall on our face before God because the security is just stuff. But the relationship with God, the there where he wants us to go, is intimacy with a loving, gracious Father. And when we look back, I would rather give up my security in order to have intimacy. Because once we give up our security and we have God, God, then we can follow him. I believe this is where it talks about being radical in our generosity. Radical in our generosity. In our service. In what we do. How we serve and whatever we give. Once we get to the point that, that security, whatever it is, is not mine. It's all God's. When God owns you, he owns everything about you. And if he owns everything about you, he says, I want you to do this. I want you to serve here. I want you to give here. And not just give. I want you to be radical. Not just in your service. I want you to be radical. I want you to serve people. I want you to serve people that can't give anything back to you. I want you to honor somebody that does not honor you. I want you to love somebody that is your enemy, but you still love them. That is the radical mindset of Christianity. It is not getting even, it's serving. And when we can serve, God does great things through us. We have challenged ourselves, what's next? To ask God what's next not only in our own personal life, but also in the life of Glenville. What is next? I don't want to answer that question for you. It wouldn't be my job to say, what is your job at Glenville? The only thing that I can say to you, what is your next, is when we humbly go before God and say, God, what is it that you need me to do? What is it that I have to give up? What do I radically need to change I need to drop my nets and follow you. The nets, some of it is fear. Sometimes it's our security. Sometimes it's our pride. You know, these disciples, they didn't lead Jesus. They didn't tell Jesus what to do. They didn't tell Jesus where to go. The Bible says they dropped their nets, they forsook all, they left everything, and they followed him. You know what believers are? You know what a Christian is? It's a Christ-like one. Our job as a disciple or Jesus Christ is to follow after God. Not to dictate to God, 
but to follow after God. Peter and his friends put aside everything for a man and followed him. It's not about his appearance. It's not about what he had because he didn't have anything. He did not have resources. What they followed was a man of God. Man, God. He was 100% human, and he's 100% God. They saw his power. We always think, well, he's important, or she is important. Well, of course somebody was going to follow them. But you know what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 30? But many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. Many who seem to be unimportant now will be the most important then. And those who are considered to be least here will be the greatest there. The there that he wants you to be is not full of self, but humble. And when we get to the point that we can be humbled before him, take our pride and leave it alone, the least shall be the greatest, not here, but in the kingdom of God. When we can humble ourselves and say, I'm not telling God what to do. I'm not going to tell Jesus where to go. I am just going to be the vessel that he can use, and wherever he asks me to go, whatever he asks me to do, I will do whatever. The greatest will be the least. And in the kingdom of God, the least will be the greatest. The determining factor is are we ready to go there? Are we ready to go where God wants us to go? The way to drop your pride is to allow God to be in control. Fear, I understand the fear. I understand the securities, because we all want to be secure. But the number one thing is hard to do for any one of us is to drop pride. Because we want our image to be important. We want what we have to be look good. We need to allow God to work. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28, it says, Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. If we are supposed to be Christ-like followers of Jesus, our main goal is to get our eyes off of ourselves and put our eyes on Christ. And when we put our eyes on Christ, things may take place, people may not like you, junk may take place, but my eyes is focused on Christ. I can forsake what I have, and I can follow after Christ. What are you proud of? That's a tough question, isn't it? What are you proud of? If I never have met you before and we go across the dinner table and we just talk, what are you going to talk about? Talk about your job, your family, your wealth, your Lord. Whatever it is that we're proud about, we're going to talk about. And if we're proud about it, and we can talk about it, God needs to own it. If we're proud about our wealth, start giving some of it away. If you're proud about your talents, man, you ought to be able to hear me sing. Serve somebody. If you're proud about your family, make sure they teach and you teach them about Christ. Honor them and allow them to reproduce who you are in others. I believe that's when genuine humility takes place. When the thing that we're proud about, we give it to God. Because God can take what we are proud about, and he can take it, and he can use it, and he can administer it, and he can divvy out our gifts in ways that we are not in charge. 
You know, if it was about what you can do and what I can do and what somebody can sing or somebody could play or somebody has talents, if it's all about look how good we are, we'll never experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. We'll experience an applause. Hey, great job. Man, you were awesome. I don't care. What we really desire more than anything else is the presence of God. And when the presence of God can come upon you, what you say, how you say it, where you go, how you interact in somebody's life, the presence of God will anoint you and you'll look back and say, I don't know what I did, but I know God showed up. And when God shows up, we are nothing because he is everything. And when we forsake all and say, I don't need it, what I desire, what I need is I'm going to give what I have because it's his anyway. I'm going to forsake what I desire. I'm going to be, my security is going to be in him. And here's the big one. And follow him. I don't like what he said. Don't make any difference. I don't agree with what he's wanting me to do. Don't make any difference. He paid for you. When you gave your life to Christ, he imputed upon his back every sin that you've ever committed. He paid the price for your sin. Your life is not yours. It is Christ's. We ought to just say, Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to give? Because it is not mine. The act of humility is offering Christ my life. Fall on my face before God. I know there's things that God's asked you to do that you're scared to do. Don't be afraid. I know there's some securities that you like holding on to. Give them up and let God do some great work. And I know you have opinions that don't match up to what somebody else says or what God wants you to do. Give it up and humble yourself and say, I'm going to follow him no matter what. I'm going to drop my nets. Peter could not follow Christ with his nets in his hands. Put him over. Okay, Lord, where do you want me to go? Let me carry all this junk. You know the first thing Jesus would say? Get rid of your past. Drop your nets and follow me. And sometimes we hold on to our nets because why? Is because if we don't like where he wants me to go, I can always go back to do what I already know I can do. And we need to say, forsake. The word forsake, I don't need that anymore. That, that, that's not me anymore. When I gave my life to Christ, my sins, it's not me anymore. I am in no condemnation because I have salvation. Condemnation is from Satan. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. And we can say, I am no condemnation because Jesus Christ paid my price full. It's behind me. I'm going to forsake it. And I'm going to move on. Doesn't mean you're not going to be convicted of your sin because that's a good thing. If you can sin and not get convicted, that's a bad thing. But when you do something and God slaps you upside the head, that's the Holy Spirit inside you say, whoa, time out. I'm in charge. Lord, I'm sorry. I need you to be back in the driver's seat. I need you to be in charge. So the question is very simple. You're carrying some nets. I carry some nets. My first net, fear. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. The biggest fear that I have is failure. There's all kinds of fears that we all have, and there's all kinds of insecurities. We need to give them over to God. And then security. Is what I have more important than what God wants me to have? Is what I can obtain myself more important than what I can give back to God? Because in my mindset, if God gave it to me in the first place, God can give me more than I already have. I have to own it. I have to be generous with it and let God bless it. 
with resources, with time, with talents, with every treasure that I have offered up to God, and then get out of God's way. Drop the net of power, control, and pride. Drop it. Whoa, 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 what would he make me do? I don't know. That's what's awesome. Well, what if he asked me to do something I don't know how to do? Great. Put yourself out on the ledge. Put yourself out there that when you have to talk, when somebody comes into your life and you're not in control, you're saying, God, I need you on this one. And he goes, you need me on every one. But you ask me on this one. And when we allow God to use us, he takes our insignificance and he molds it to his greatness and he delivers something that we could never possibly do on our own. Drop our stinking nets and go to the there that God has for you. There's things. There's things that captivate us. There's one thing that we have to take with us. Drop the stuff. Drop the fear. Drop the security. Drop the pride. But do you know in that last verse, there's one thing that they took? They took Jesus. And when Jesus is in the lead, when God is more important than anything else, when we follow him, open the Bible, teach, pray, love, honor, exalt, lift him up, praise his name, give him glory, give him preeminence by following. Just follow. We can never follow when we want to be in charge. We, Jesus, I got this one. Why don't you follow, I, I, why don't you follow me on this one? They forsook all and followed him. Our challenge for this entire month, where is the there that God wants you to go to? What are you needing to forsake, to give up? What are you needing to do in order to follow him where he wants you to go? We can make those plans, but God has that plan for you. We need to be humbled, quiet-spirited, and seek his face, drop our nets, and say, Lord, give me direction. I got my Bible just give me the GPS coordinates. I want to go, and I want to go where you want me to go, and I want to go with you. Because everything that you do for me is greater than anything I can do on my own. I can't do anything without you. Radical Christianity, radical generosity, radical servanthood is just doing what God asks you to do and abandon. Not for self-glory, not for what people think, so God can get the glory. And when God gets the glory, God, oh, he allows us that presence of God, the peace of God, the blessings of God, because we are not a sponge trying to absorb it. What we are is a reflection, just giving it back to him. And when we can give God the glory, he can do anything he desires through us, with us, and for us. Will you please bow your heads? I'm going to have Justin come up, and we're going to have a song of invitation. And in that song of invitation today, what nets do you need to drop? What in your life do you need to give to God? If you have nets, if you have things, if you have issues and you need to give them to God, I'm going to ask you right now, in the presence of the power of God, in the presence, in the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit, come to the altar, bow your head, and say, Lord, here's my net. Here's what I hold on to. Here's what I need to give to you. Radically. You want God to do something radical in your life? Do something radical today. And give him what he needs. And that is your heart, your life, 
your salvation and your future. Go there. Wherever the there is that he wants for you, don't let anything back there keep you from doing what he wants you to go into the future. Dear Father, be with us today. Work within our hearts, our lives. Lord, drop our nets before you. And Lord, please, please give us the direction and the peace and the presence of your power that whatever you have in store for us, we are not afraid to go where you want us to go. We are not so secure in our own life that we will never give it to you. And we are so humbled that we do not want the glory of God for ourselves, but we want you to be lifted up and praised. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Will you please stand to your feet? An opportunity to pray. An opportunity to talk to God. An opportunity to get where you need to go, the there that he has in store for you. Are you tired of wandering in the wilderness? Are you tired of all that? I am. Why don't we do something today that will change us for tomorrow? No more status quo. No more walking around. Do something great for the power of God. And God can change your life. Where is your there? Let us ask for God's direction on that.